les dejo con el profesor Didac Llorens. Muchas gracias. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. That's great. I'd like to share my screen as well. Um, I'll be following up our point presentation, which I hope you can see now. Yes. Can you see the the PowerPoint? Yes, okay, great. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank um, Maria Angeles Escobar and uh, Maria Dolores Castrillo and also our new colleague Sara Pistola for the work on in organizing this, which I think is a is a great initiative for us. So thank you very much and thank you to everyone who joined this morning. Um, so I'll be um, talking to you about Eliot's drama, um, its significance and its Spanish reception, which is a very large part of what we're doing in the project. And um, I will begin uh, with an overview of its history and, and significance. I suppose most of you are familiar with, uh, with Eliot and uh, with his uh, reputation as uh, one of the main poets of the first half of the 20th century, coinciding with the literary movement that we call modernism. You probably know about his uh, most famous poems, The Wasteland, uh, which was first published in 1922, and uh, which is um, a very significant interwar uh, poem, a poem that captured very effectively the collective mood of those years between the First and the Second World War. As I said, it, it was published in 1922, which means that uh, next year we will be celebrating the centenary. And uh, there are a lot of conferences and events and, and publications coming up. Uh, so the Wasteland, uh, you may uh, also be familiar or you may have heard about Eliot's Four Protects, uh, a sequence of uh, four um, long poems uh, published between 1936 and 1942 separately, also re revolving um, uh, uh, around the trauma of, of war. And uh, in some sense, we could define the, the four quartets as poems of spiritual recovery uh, during the war years and, and uh, during the immediate post-war of, of the Second World War late 30s, early 40s. Um, they were published separately originally, but then together as a sequence and, uh, and the culmination, we could say, of Eliot's uh, um, poetic uh, work. They were included in his collected poems as a, as a sequence. So um, Eliot's reputation as a poet also uh, as a literary critic and editor. Um, he was probably the most influential literary critic, uh, again, during the, the first half of the, of the 20th century, the, the modernist period, with um, emphasis on um, concepts like impersonality in poetry, um, concepts like literary tradition, the historical sense, um, the objective correlative, all these are concepts that Eliot coined and theorized and that have stayed in, in literary 
criticism and are still widely used. So Eliot contributed to shaping uh, literary ta uh, tastes uh, during the, the, the early decades of the, of the 20th century. His most influential essays were published in the 20s and 30s. He was also the editor of a, um, a very important journal, The Criterion, which uh, published groundbreaking work by other writers. Virginia Woolf, for example, just to mention uh, one. And, and later in his life, um, he joined Faber and Faber, Faber and Guire originally, then late, uh, Faber and Faber. And um, he developed a very important um, task there as an editor. Um, he was also a dramatist. Uh, uh, playwright, although his his drama is less known and uh, and less researched, and this is actually one of the reasons for this project. Um, he also wrote uh, plays. Um, he he was focusing on drama later in his career. Um, his drama, as I said, is uh, little known because of, of its characteristics, it's, it's verse drama, it's poetic drama. Uh, it is a very dense form of drama. Uh, it's not exactly uh, allegorical, but it's very dense conceptually and uh, thematically. And it is also openly religious. So all these uh, descriptors, all these uh, um, qualities of Eliot's drama help explain why it has become a minority uh, drama. It enjoyed relative success during the, the 40s and 50s, but um, after that, um, it's been, I won't say forgotten, but uh, it's been, um, critics have lost interest in it. Still, I believe, and that that's the reason why, why um, we applied for this project, uh, we believe that Eliot's plays are a wonderful, um, wonderful material for, for research and exploration. So um, Eliot was always interested in, in drama, although, as I said, he um, focused um, on drama uh, late in his career, but he was always interested in it. He wrote very influential essays. I just referred to Eliot's importance as a, as a critic. Um, he was especially interested in Elizabethan drama. Um, he wrote um, key um, essays like Hamlet and his, pro and his problems, um, um, essays on Philip Massinger, on Shakespeare. Um, and these essays show that he was um, theoretically and from the perspective of criticism, he was always very interested <clears throat> in drama as a literary form. So um, very um, important essays in the 20s on drama. In uh, 1926, Eliot made his first attempt at writing a play. The play was called, is called uh, Sweeney Agonistes, um, but he didn't finish it. So it's, it's an unfinished play, which he included in his collected poems, actually as an unfinished poem rather than a play. So it's, it's a dramatic um, poem, but he, um, he never came to, to terms with it in a way that he could that he could finish it satisfactorily. So it's, it has remained a very interesting um, unfinished poem, very interesting in what it is and in what it might have been. Sweeney Agonistes was strongly influenced by Music Hall, which uh, Eliot was very interested in. Uh, it has the influence of jazz, um, jazz poetry, and it, it is a prodigy of, of rhythm. Uh, so Eliot was focusing here very much on the, uh, on poetic rhythm. 
So this was his uh, first attempt at writing poetry, uh, but it is unusual. And uh, there's certain continuities between this play and the plays that he wrote later, but also some very important differences. Uh, so, 1926, uh, Sweeney Agonistes, we come to 1927, which is a crucial year to understand Eliot's um, biography and how it is reflected in his work. Uh, this is the year of Eliot's conversion, um, 1927. Uh, he was baptized in the, in the Church of England. He had been brought up in America as a Unitarian. Uh, but um, in 1927, he was he was living he had been living in London for a few years, um, and he became a British citizen and he became uh, a member of the Church of England, where he would practice as an Anglo-Catholic. This is crucial because uh, from this moment on, his poetry first and later his uh, drama would be in in a very close connection. Uh, with his uh, religious faith, with his religious outlook and, and, and experience. And we could say that uh, um, he developed a kind of modern mysticism, so uh, um, mysticism in the context of modern secularization and, uh, and post-war post uh, trauma. Can, can you all hear me? Is, is everything okay? It's also quiet, I'm beginning to worry. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So, um, in, the, in the mid-1930s, um, Eliot's uh, uh, poetry, uh, he, he declared that his poetry was extinguished, that he could say nothing more um, of relevance as a poet. And he was increasingly interested in drama as applied poetry. Um, he was interested in experimenting with poetry um, um, through uh, the medium of drama. And he was uh, thinking, uh, he was aspiring to fulfill a project of reviving uh, verse drama. So in a sense, um, a project of producing the equivalent of the great drama uh, of the Elizabethan period in a modern uh, 20th century context. On the other hand, he, was, he had also in mind the idea of using drama, uh, which he thought of as the most social of the arts, uh, the, the literary form that could influence people more directly. He also aspired to be able to use drama um, almost as a proselytizing tool. So, so this was a kind of proselytizing mission to convey his uh, religious uh, ideas. Eliot is, is very religious, but never sanctimonious. So uh, th that makes his drama um, very interesting from a, a humanistic point of view. And so uh, the last years of Eliot's career uh, were dedicated, were devoted to drama uh, very intensely. And he was always uh, keen to um, continue his career as a dramatist. And with great humility, he was always keen to improve, uh, to make his drama successful, to reach an audience. I will now uh, show you the chronology of his plays. The first one, uh, 1926, Sweeney Agonistis. Uh, of which uh, I have I've already told you about it, so I won't say anything more. Um, 1934 was the year uh, in which Eliot uh, published The Rock, which is a, a, a pageant play. So a, a pageant play, a pageant is a, um, a sequence of historical scenes. Uh, it has elements of uh, um, of parading, uh, of, of procession even, uh, but this was performed in a theatre. And uh, we could say it's a, it's a summary of uh, the ecclesiastical history of London. So um, <clears throat> the story is, um, the main story is the story of, of building a church, but there are 
um, we could say flashbacks to London's past and uh, how churches were built and destroyed and, and reconstructed. Um, it is also interesting how Eliot incorporated uh, different social dialects. Uh, uh, this is very much a London play, so that we have uh, uh, scenes in Cockney, which uh, shocked many, uh, many intellectuals at the time. So this was a very daring um, choice of, of uh, language and, and register for Eliot. <clears throat> the following year, 1935, Eliot um, um, had the premiere of Murder in the Cathedral, which is probably his most famous play, and you've probably heard about it. Uh, this is the play that dramatizes uh, St. Thomas Beckett's return to uh, Canterbury after an, an exile in France. And uh, his arrival at Canterbury Cathedral, where he faces uh, martyrdom. He's, he's murdered in the cathedral, hence the, the title of the play. Um, both these plays, The Rock and uh, Murder in the Cathedral, were commissioned plays, um, which uh, forced Eliot to, um, to adapt to what was required of him, and, and so um, improve his, his poetic language and adapt it to, to the uh, dramatic medium. Both uh, combine verse and prose. Um, the Rock has beautiful verse choruses that were published as part of Eliot's collected poems, but also uh, uh, scenes in prose. Most of the scenes are in prose. Murder in the Cathedral also has um, um, segments in prose, famously St. Thomas Beckett's sermon in the middle of the play. So Eliot at this point was still experimenting with the uh, verse and prose. He would, he would gradually evolve to a very pure, transparent verse that would be the only expressive medium for him. So his later plays are all in verse, but these still combine verse <clears throat> and prose. Also uh, common to the rock and uh, murder in the cathedral is the use of a chorus um, as a central device, uh, a chorus inspired by uh, Greek drama. And uh, they are both historical plays. Um, murder in the cathedral very clearly, it dramatizes historical events. And the rock also has the historical approach which is typical of a pageant play. Next um, is the family reunion, 1939, which is uh, in many ways, uh, uh, this play was a turning point for, for Eliot. It was uh, his first play as he, as he called, he called this place, plays of contemporary life. So there is a, a significant change from the medieval setting of murder in the cathedral to this uh, present day setting for Eliot. And his challenge was to find a verse form suitable for a modern uh, realistic setting. Um, so the, the setting of the family reunion is contemporary, so the same the same time as the time of the audience uh, who, who were watching the play. The setting is also high class, and this is a, a also a defining um, characteristic of Eliot's plays. It's this uh, kind of aristocratic mansion house setting, uh, a bit like Downton Abbey. I always uh, compare it with Downton Abbey. Um, and um, it's based on Aeschylus the Furies, um, the classical um, play by Aeschylus, uh, part of the Oresteia. Um, and this is also important because it sets a pattern. Eliot's subsequent uh, plays would also be based 
on classical dramatic texts and in some sense they would be rewritings of, of these uh, myths, uh, the myths contained in these classical plays. He also uses a, a chorus here, but his use of a chorus in this play is rather unconventional in the sense that the, the characters who uh, are part of the chorus, sometimes they speak in unison as, as choruses do, uh, but at other uh, scenes in the play, they speak as distinct characters, so characters with a definite identity. Uh, so this was unusual and it wasn't very well received by, by critics and audiences. Although from our perspective today, it was a very innovative use of the chorus. The next play is the, the Cocktail Party. You can see there's a gap here uh, of 10 years, 1939, the family reunion, and 1949, the Cocktail Party. This was because of the war, obviously. So uh, in, in, in those, uh, the war years, it became very difficult, not to say impossible, to, to uh, produce plays in, in a city like, like London which was uh, suffering the war very uh, so badly. So during those years, Eliot, um, he devoted those years to completing the, the sequence of four quartets. Um, the cocktail party was finally staged for the first time in 1949 at the Edinburgh Festival. And um, it's Eliot's first comedy. So, um, Eliot was always very critical of his dramatic work and he, he wasn't very happy with the cold reception that the family reunion had had. And he thought that if he changed to comedy, his plays would have a, a better reception and they would reach a wider audience. So um, this is what he does with the cocktail party. He um, adapts to the conventions of the drawing room comedy, which was the, the dramatic uh, genre that was more successful, most successful at the time in London. And um, he combines the, the lightness, uh, we could say, of drawing room comedy with the, the depth of his, of his uh, message. And he did that, that very successfully. So, um, the Cocktail Party is in some ways um, a drawing room comedy. Eliot's comedies have also been called Dantean or divine comedies in the sense um, Dante was a great influence for Eliot, um, a kind of constant influence throughout his career. And um, these plays are called Dantean Dante in the sense that the, the, their characters fulfill their destinies in accordance to a divine plan. The cocktail party was also Eliot's first commercial success. Uh, it ran very successfully both at, at uh, the West End in London and, and in New York too, in Broadway. It received a Tony Award. So it was, it, uh, it was a very successful uh, play. Um, it is different from the others. Um, I was telling you earlier about the aristocratic uh, mansion house setting of, of most of Eliot's plays, but the cocktail party is different in that it is set in London rather than in the English country and uh, its characters are liberal professionals rather than aristocrats. It, it is a sort of um, bourgeois uh, setting rather than high class, um, um, aristocratic setting. So the last uh, plays by Eliot, The Cocktail Party, and the next two I'll be talking about briefly, are, as I said, uh, Eliot's Divine Comedies. And um, Carol Smith, who is a, an Eliot scholar, who's uh, analysed Eliot's drama very uh, in, in great depth, she um, defined the sort of blueprint uh, situation in these comedies um, as 
uh, protagonists struggle to recognize and pursue a spiritual path in a world that fails to acknowledge his mission. Uh, the next uh, play, 1953, is The Confidential Clark, which is a, a play that has um, a, a Victorian uh, feel to it. Um, there are very interesting continuities with the Victorian drama, uh, and this is curious in the, in the sense that Eliot was never too interested in, in Victorian uh, literature, but here we can identify um, or at least I can, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I see some connections with uh, plays like The Importance of Being Earnest, some of Wilde's society comedies, like Earnest or A Woman of No Importance, Lady Windermere's Fan. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit that, that uh, atmosphere. In The Confidential Clerk, this play from 1953, the main character is an orphan. Um, and uh, the, the dramatic situation consists in this person trying to find out who his, uh, who's, who his parents uh, are. The Confidential Clark is, uh, is also relevant um, in that um, we have here Eliot's verse at its most transparent. So he, play after play, he struggled to make his verse sound more natural. Uh, so he always said that he didn't want the audience watching the play, uh, realizing that they were listening to poetry. So this is um, the, the Confidential Clark is perhaps um, the play where verse is uh, the closest to prose. So much so that uh, many uh, critics couldn't see the point of this. So they, they said, uh, what, what's the point of, of verse being so close to prose? Why don't you, why doesn't Eliot just write in prose? But, um, but this was part of Eliot's conviction and project to make verse sound very natural and very conversational. This is something that Natalia will probably elaborate on uh, later. Um, and the last uh, play uh, in 1958 is The Elder Statement, Statesman, uh, which is um, a very personal play for Eliot. It reflects his new life um, with his second wife um, after a very difficult first, uh, first marriage. He found happiness with, uh, with uh, Valerie, Valerie Eliot, Valerie Fletcher Eliot. And um, the main character in The Elder Statesman is Lord Claverton. Again, we have this aristocratic uh, milieu. Um, and uh, Lord Claverton has to undertake a life, what we could call a life review, um, uh, examination of, of conscience, examination of his past. And he will have to purge the guilt he feels about things that happened in the past. And um, two characters from the past reappear. They visit him. Uh, they are a bit like Dickensian ghosts of Christmas past, and they help him to um, to achieve a sort of spiritual rebirth uh, in in the last stages of his life. So uh, this was the last of of Eliot's place. Um, he died in 1965, I, I didn't mention that. But um, these last two plays, The Confidential Clark, The Elder Statesman, were less successful because of the evolution of British drama at the time. There were new trends developing, um, and we could mention uh, The Angry Young Men, uh, the kitchen sink drama, um, which stressed very much uh, social realism, and this is a key. Um, this is a key aspect because this uh, the new drama of the fifties uh, and sixties in Britain um, 
was stressing the, the problems of the working class. There was an emphasis on working class characters, also on secular themes of social realism, as I said, also in the language. And all this, and all this made Eliot's drama seem very anachronistic. So Eliot's drama, which, as I said, was um, high class in its, in its setting, uh, it was spoken in verse when the new British drama was capturing very much how people talked very realistically. So um, all, the, all the new trends in British drama were going in the opposite direction to, to what Eliot, Eliot's plays um, represented. So from the 1960s, uh, Eliot's drama was increasingly less, less produced and uh, people lost interest in it lost interest in it, sorry. Okay, so I'm now um, moving on to um, the next um, section of my presentation, which is uh, about uh, the performance of Eliot's plays in Spain. So what happened in Spain? So in Spain, uh, obviously, Eliot's plays have been performed even less, um, again, with the exception of uh, Murder in the Cathedral, which is Eliot's most popular play, and uh, which has been performed several times in Spain um, since the late 40s, often in religious uh, and medieval settings. This is a play that is often performed in churches, in, in cathedrals. Um, in England, it was first performed in Canterbury Cathedral, where where the, the events of the play actually happened centuries before. And um, in Spain, um, I'll be referring to some, uh, um, to some of the most interesting performances. I won't be doing that chronologically. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I will begin with two of the most recent. Uh, this is actually the most uh, recent I, I, I know of. Uh, in 2016, it was performed at the Mosque Cathedral in Córdoba uh, as uh, La Sangre de los Mártires. This is a, an, an alternative title to Murder in the Cathedral. It's a, it's a quote from uh, one of the last choruses of the play. Um, and it was uh, performed by uh, an amateur company, Teatro Clásico de Córdoba, Teatro Par. So this was 2016. In 2012, uh, Murder in the Cathedral was performed in Barcelona. Uh, it was staged to celebrate the restoration of the main facade of the cathedral. So it was performed outside. Uh, again, this was a semi-amateur production, um, both in, in Spanish and Catalan, and it had a musical accompaniment. I can show you some images of these uh, productions. So uh, on the left here, you have the, a picture from the one in the in the in Cordoba, and the other two pictures are from the Barcelona production of 2012. So um, there had been uh, remote antecedents of this uh, of these recent productions. Um, in 1949, the students of the uh, Barcelona Institut del Teatre performed the play in Spanish at the Plaza del Rey in the heart of the Barri Gothic in Barcelona. And this is probably the earliest uh, performance of a play by Eliot in Spain. One year later, um, there was a production in, uh, in Burgos, the Old Terrassa. So um, in, in Terrassa, it was uh, performed in the impressive uh, complex of Gothic churches, um, which some of us will know. If, you've, if you have uh, examined at the UNED in Terrassa, you probably know about this, uh, these churches, and Murder in the Cathedral was performed there in 1950. Um, and in Burgos, also in 1950, uh, and uh, outside the cathedral in Burgos at the atrium. I think it's called Puerta de la Pallejería. This is where it was performed in 1950. And 
the cast included uh, actors who would become very famous later. So this production had Fernando Fernán Gómez in it uh, and Manuel de Fenta, so uh, 1950 in Burgos. There is also an opera, an Italian opera by Ildebrando Pizzetti, As Assassinio nella Cattedrale, which was performed at the uh, Teatro del Liceo. It's very faithful to Eliot's play. Um, and um, it was programmed for the seasons of 1958, 1959, and 20 years later, 1978-79. And uh, um, interestingly, it was the first performance of the play after its uh, premiere at La Scala in Milan. So it was the first performance of, of, of the opera, sorry, I think I said play, of the opera um, outside Italy. And uh, um, as far as I know, it hasn't been programmed again in, in Spain. This is a, a picture of the 1949 uh, production uh, of Asesinato en la Catedral at the Barri Gothic Plaza del Rey in, in Barcelona. Um, these are posters of the Terrassa production on the on the left and the, the opera on the right. And um, I'd like now to move on to Eliot's contemporary plays, the, the plays set in contemporary uh, life. So um, in 1949, um, there, there was a production again in Barcelona. Most of these plays were performed in Madrid, as we will see, but this is an exception. Um, an, an amateur production of the family reunion in, in Barcelona, which together with the with the production at the Plaza del Rey, they're probably the earliest performances in Spain. Um, so this was very efficiently translated by the linguist Ernesto Carratala, who was a nephew of the poet Luis Cernuda. Um, the the reviews praised the translation, although they were also, they were very critical with the play. They thought it was um, dark and and gloomy, which in some sense is true, I suppose. Um, 1956, uh, there was a new production of Reunión de Familia, the family reunion. This time in Madrid. This is a very interesting uh, production by uh, Pequeño Teatro Dido, which was one of the small um, chamber companies. They were called um, Teatro de Cámara, Teatro de Arte y Ensayo in, in, the, in the 50s in Spain. They were very active uh, at the time and, and characterized by their adventurous choice of, of repertoire. They could do this because uh, Francoist censorship was rather lenient with these companies um, because they could they were only allowed to perform the play once, so only one night. So it was it was a, a one a one off. So censorship didn't didn't bother very much with them. Um, so uh, the Spanish version of this uh, of this um, play was by Elizabeth Gate. Uh, a pseudonym for Elisa Fernández Cancela, and uh, it was revised by uh, Carmen Conde, the prolific author and intellectual of the Generación del 27, who adapted, um, allegedly, uh, she adapted the play to Eliot's verse patterns, so she, she did a poetic adaptation. There's a bit of a mystery surrounding this translation, which perhaps Natalia can comment on later, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. Um, next performance, 1952, in Madrid, um, uh, a performance of the Cocktail Party, um, Eliot's most commercial uh, play. It was produced at the Teatro Maria Guerrero in 1952, a public theatre, uh, Teatro Nacional already back then, and uh, the manager of the, of the Maria Guerrero at the time was uh, Luis Escobar, the the intellectual writer, actor, comedian. You may you may remember him from the 
Berlanga Escopeta Nacional Films. But uh, he was a very, very good manager at uh, Maria Guerrero in the 50s. And <clears throat> despite the very difficult post-war conditions, he managed to uh, produce plays by some of the most interesting international playwrights of the time. So he introduced Spanish audiences to Thornton Wilder, uh, to J.B. Priestley, and to Eliot, whom he actually met. So Eliot was visiting uh, Escobar in Madrid in 1952, the year before this production. So this is probably the, the most ambitious production of a play by Eliot ever in Spain. So at, at, at Teatro Nacional with a, um, a big budget, a very good cast, including Jose Maria Rodero, Adolfo Marcillac. So this was, this was a big thing. Um, so um, it, but however, it was received rather coldly. So most reviews praised Eliot as a, as a literary giant, but um, they, they had object objections for the play. Um, the main one was the predominance of speech over action. So this play, play was perceived very much as, a, it was perceived as a very linguistic play. Um, a play in which uh, very dense dialogues uh, were prominent to the detriment of dramatic action. So this was one objection. And the other objection was a, a, a moral, religious, social objection, which had to do with the theme of adultery. So the, the main two characters here, Edward and Lavini Campbell, are two middle, are a middle class couple who are going through a marital crisis, and they both had have adulterous relationships. So the the uh, reviewers at the time uh, were a bit uncomfortable with that, especially in the case of the woman, um, as you know. So, so we must bear in mind that adultery in 1952 in Spain was a crime, and uh, it was it was a much worse crime for a woman than for a man. Um, so. Uh, cocktail party in Teatro Nacional, probably the most important of, of the productions in Spain. There was another one a few years later, 1952, in Barcelona, by a TEU. So the TEU, the, the, the university companies, uh, um, they produced, they chose Cocktail Party in 1955. This is a picture from the Maria Guerrero uh, performance in, in 1952, a picture from one of the reviews. And uh, I will uh, now move on to uh, um, dramatizations of Eliot's poetry. So not 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 plays in themselves, but uh, um, productions that you, that draw on Eliot's poetry uh, and its dramatic potential. The first one I'd like to talk about um, is from 2013, and it's called uh, La Pelle e Sharka. So this was a, 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 a text by Francesc Cerro Ferran drawing on Eliot's The Wasteland, which in, in Catalan is often translated as La Terra e Xorca. Uh, so Cerro uh, Ferran draws on The Wasteland by Eliot and also on, on uh, um, La Pell de Brau by Salvador Espriu, who is uh, one of the main Catalan poets of the 20th century. And, um, in many ways comparable to Eliot. So um, what this production did was to compare, to, to associate Eliot and Spreu, to associate the Wasteland and La Pelle de Braus, so that the title of the production is a permutation of the titles of, of the most important books by these two poets, La Terra y Xorca, La Pelle de Brau, La Piel de Toro in Spanish, so he combines both titles and calls this La Pelle e Xorca. Um, so an association of both poets, both books, both social moods, post-war moods, the Spanish Civil War and the First World War. And uh, the staging relied on video projections of wasteland settings and art images 
uh, like Picasso's Guernica or Goya's print series, The Disasters of War. Uh, so all these um, um, images were suggestive of Spain's tragic fate. Um, there was an only act actress, Che Arana, playing different roles, mainly Tiresias. Uh, if, if you are familiar with Wasteland, you know that Tiresias is the main voice or the main character in the poem. And um, there was also an attempt to reproduce the polyphony of Eliot's poem. So this was in 2013. Um, you will all know Cats, the musical Cats, uh, which was uh, um, performed in Madrid at the Teatro Coliseum in 2003 from, for two years, from 2003 to 2005. Um, this is a musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, the music's by Webber, and the libretto was by Trevor Nunn, the who, who was at the time the director of the Shakespeare, um, the Royal Shakespeare Company. So um, it is based on on a book by Eliot uh, for children. It's a it's a poetry collection for children called Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, and uh, it was successfully produced in Madrid. Uh, it it's been successfully produced all over the world, as as you know. So it it combines um, um, the poems in old um, old possum old, old possum's book of practical cats, also some um, fragments from Eliot's earlier poems. The most famous song in this musical, Memory, has uh, bits from some of Eliot's earliest poems from 1917, 1920, and Trevor Nunn gave his poems. A narrative thread, and uh, Weber combined different musical styles depending on the character of of the cat that was performing. So there is musical, uh, the, there's jazz, there's cabaret, and and it's a it's a it's a very interesting um, take on on the dramatic elements of of Eliot's poetry. And uh, it was translated, the, the, the libretto by Nan was translated into Spanish by the Mexican uh, uh, musician Mariano de Tri. And finally, um, as I said, I'm not presenting this in, in chronological order, but in, in 2010, uh, there was a production of The Wasteland, uh, a dramatization of the poem um, directed by Deborah Warner and performed by Fiona Shaw at the Teatro Español. So uh, uh, it was performed in, in English with uh, Spanish subtitles. And this was a production that had toured the world from the late 90s, and it arrived in Madrid in, in 2010. These are images from La Pelle Sharca um, from 2013. And uh, another one from La Pelle Shorca, and this is Cats, uh, uh, Madrid cat, Cats on the right, and and the Fiona shows the wasteland in uh, in Madrid in 2010. Okay, um, I will now tell you about the translations. This is the, the third, the last part of my presentation. So, um, translations into Spanish are scarce, uh, again, with the exception of Murder in the Cathedral, um, which has been translated several times, and it can be read in Galician, in Catalan, and there are several translations into Spanish, uh, some of them quite rec recent. This is a, a list of the translations of Murder in the Cathedral. I won't go through, through, through them. Um, this is also in our project's website, Perhaps if we have time at the end, I can show you the website too. I don't think I'll have time, but anyway, um, you, you can find it there. Um, so the translations uh, um, for the other plays, um, the Contemporary Society plays, are, um, are, are few and far between. Um, the, the, those that were preferred, uh, prepared specifically for the performances mentioned above um, aren't published. 
The Cocktail Party was translated in prose by Jose Mendez Herrera, who was a very um, reputed translator, uh, Premio Nacional de Traducción. He had specialized in, in English literature, uh, Dickens, uh, Victorian literature. He had translated a lot from English. Um, and uh, then uh, Dido's version of the family reunion was by Elizabeth Gate and, uh, and Carmen Conde, as I said earlier. And uh, these translations are not published, but we were able to locate them and consult them at the Archivo General de la Administración. So um, they were part of the censorship file, which, which includes a copy of the libretto or the the play script um, to be performed. And we were able to, to consult them and to scan them uh, and, and take them out of the boxes where they'd been sleeping for many years. Um, there was a previous translation uh, of the family reunion by Rosa Chacel, the, the famous Generación del 27 uh, um, novelist. And um, this was published in 1953 uh, by MFA in Argentina, where Chafel was exiled. And MFA in Argentina was the publisher who, who published most of the, of the translations of Eliot's plays in the, in the 60s and 70s. But um, um, these are translations of the Cocktail Party. These are translations of the other two plays, Confidential, Clark and Elder Statesman. Unfortunately, these are very old translations. They appeared in the 60s and 70s, uh, which is one of the reasons for this project, because we are working on new translations of these plays um, 50, 60, 70 years later. Um, right, so... Um, I'm, I'm coming to my conclusion, and I will now tell you more specifically about the project uh, very briefly. I will, I will present the main thesis and the objectives of our project. So um, the main thesis I have phrased uh, like this, uh, it's, it's a bit intricate, but I think it covers all the, the aspects where um, we're focusing on. So the main thesis is researching the translation, impact and performance history of Eliot's plays in Spain that will yield relevant results for a complete study of his general reception in Spain. And incidentally, it will contribute to a fuller understanding of Eliot's poetry as a coherent, cohesive and evolving whole. So um, pursuing this uh, thesis requires the achievement of three general interrelated objectives. The first one is studying Eliot's original dramatic texts, studying their reception. The second would be studying their reception and performance in a Spanish context. And the third, producing updated research-based translations in Spanish. These three areas, these three wide objectives can be broken down into the following more detailed uh, specific objectives. Uh, the first one is studying the original five plays by Eliot. That, that's a rather ob obvious objective. So the, the author is characteristically allusive uh, and his work is highly cohesive. So it's important to establish cross references between the plays and also uh, secondarily between the plays and the poems and, and the essays as well. So um, this, is, this is part of, of this objective and also to study the, to examine the accentual pattern of Eliot's verse drama because um, our, our aspiration is to reproduce uh, the original verse, the original prosody of Eliot's drama. Uh, which Natalia will be talking about just now. Um, so um, we attempt to reproduce this in, in translation. We're working on a, on, an, on a critical edition of Eliot's plays, will, which will be published by Visor, 
which as you know is uh, is a publisher specializing in poetry and uh, we're working on that uh, translations accompanied by introductions and notes the second objective is to study previous spanish translations of the plays contrastively uh, seeking to identify specific problems and difficulties um, as well as felicitous or, or uh, unsatisfactory solutions so uh, uh, translation analysis um, evidently the aim is to improve uh, existing translations on the basis of this analysis and um, um, in order to accomplish these objectives these objective it's necessary to locate all translations even the ones that have not been published uh, the third is uh, the translation itself so translating uh, into spanish the plays that Eliot wrote as a full-time playwright as a self-professed full-time play playwright um, we, we're leaving sweeney agonistas out because it has been translated several times and recently as part of Eliot's collected poems, but we are working on the rest um, from the rock to the elder statesman. Um, these works are not, uh, unfortunately, they are not readily available in Spanish today. Um, and uh, I think uh, we think that uh, um, it would be a good thing to have them to make them available for Spanish speaking readers and scholars. Um, the translations that we have are very difficult to, to find. Uh, they were published many years ago, many decades ago. And obviously in preparing new translations, we, we, we are taking into account recent international bibliography uh, on Eliot's drama, which is invaluable in shedding light on certain, certain aspects of the text. Uh, which will be better reflected in the translations. The fourth objective is uh, um, preparing uh, introductory studies and notes for each of the five plays, uh, the sixth plays, sorry, the sixth plays, um, incorporating, as I was saying, knowledge derived from the study of the plays, uh, the reading of secondary sources on Eliot's drama, and these uh, paratexts the introductions and the notes uh, will be useful for readers and students with little or no background uh, knowledge of Eliot's plays, and perhaps especially attractive for those familiar with Eliot's poetry, but not with his drama. And the last one is uh, researching the performance history of Eliot's plays in Spain. So the Spanish uh, reception of his in performance can be traced examining uh, newspaper reviews, memoirs of theater professionals involved in the production, censorship uh, files, even though Eliot was, was not a problematic uh, author for, for um, um, Francoist censorship. And uh, of course, in order to do, to do this, we're, um, drawing on, uh, obviously, on the Biblioteca Nacional, several drama research uh, centers, like the one at the Fundación Juan Marc, the Centro Dramático Nacional also has a very uh, useful um, library and, and databases. The Archivo General de la Administración, uh, as, as I mentioned. And, uh, and that's it. Um, so, um, Eliot's drama has received um, less uh, critical uh, uh, academic attention. It is often neglected uh, and dismissed, but um, we think that the plays constitute a wealth of material for a better understanding of, the, of Eliot's complete work. And uh, their study also allows us to explore the history of British drama in the first half of the 20th century and a very interesting transition from modernism to postmodernism in drama. And uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention.
I'm not sure if I'm meant to <laughs> to talk or is anyone can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, if there's if there's a question, if there are any questions or, or anything, I'll, I'll be very happy to to answer them. I really enjoyed your presentation, so thank you. Just uh... thank you very much, Noah. <laughs> oh, this I think. Linda has raised her hand. Hi, uh, Didac. Hello. Thank you very much. It was very uh, inspiring to talk. I would like just to mention the, the fact that uh, drama in Spain is particularly um, active in Catalonia, right? So I think that. Yeah. So uh, why is it so? Oh, do you think that it is because they are more involved in drama studies, or is there a, a, why is this a traditional idea mm -hmm. of uh, having drama in Catalonia, whereas in other parts of Spain, this is not so? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a difficult question. It's 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 broad. I will. I think I'll. I'll focus it on Eliot. And I did have, I, I've, I've thought of that very much about, you know, the kind of Catalonia or Barcelona Madrid difference in terms of Eliot's productions. And specifically um, with Murder in the Cathedral. And I thought of one of the main themes of Murder in the Cathedral, which is the conflict uh, church state. So that's very much at the heart of the play. And I think this is something that must have been attractive for the for the Catalan Church at the time, because this the Catalan Church at the time was a sort of focus of anti-Francoist uh, resistance. But then again, the the play was performed um, in in Burgos, in Madrid, in in several places too. And and actually, the most important production. Uh, as, as I was saying, was the one in Madrid, the Cocktail Party production in 1952. So, um, I don't know, it may have to do also with the fact that um, um, during the post-war, uh, Catalonia was sort of m more open to things coming from from France, from, you know, from other countries. I, 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 I don't know, I, I wouldn't like to say anything very definitive, but uh, all these things may have to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Marta has thank you. Yes, uh, raised have... her hand too. Yes, Hello. Uh, thank you. Hi, hi. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Uh, Dita, uh, I would like to congratulate you on this research project, which I think is just brilliant and something that was very much needed in the literary area in, in Spain and also, also abroad. Um, I have one question related to our research group, ELSO, English Literary uh, Studies in Society. Uh, you, I think, maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you were saying that Elliot thought that the uh, drama was, uh, I think you said, uh, a more social art than, mm. than poetry, obviously. Yeah. So, in, in which way was uh, um, his drama um, impact in social society at the time or in which way is there, is there a common line of thought from the 1930s to 1950s in Elio's drama in re, in relation to maybe his religious outlook or maybe the post-war trauma also in re, in relation to the spiritual elements of his place yeah well um there's a very interesting thing about Elio's drama is that in some way each play goes a bit further than the previous one or it goes in a slightly different direction so um his first plays the rock and murder in the cathedral had quite a quite an impact um in the interwar uh 
period, sort of pre-Second World War period, and uh, plays like Murder in the Cathedral were actually performed in uh, air raid shelters during the war. Um, and th th they were plays very suitable to be performed by amateur groups, which meant that they had a very close connection with, you know, society, with amateur groups. And um, um, yes, Elliot was um, from the from the late mid thirties. Elliot was was persuaded that he that drama was the way to go, so the the the, the most direct way to reach an audience. And um, maybe what I said during my presentation was overemphasizing or overstressing a bit the the religious aspect. It's um, which is very important. It's crucial, but he wanted people to realize that uh, society was becoming too secularized and um, and dehumanized in 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 many ways um, and that was the message that he wanted to get through and that's why he evolved from um, more poetic to more transparent plays from tragedies to comedies um so he was always trying to improve i think it's very it's quite poignant in a sense that <clears throat> this was the great poet the nobel prize um and he was very humble in in criticizing his own work in trying to work harder in order to connect more successfully with people um, I'm not sure if I'm answering you. I hope I have at least yes, partly please. done so. Yes. <laughs> no, you are, you are. Thank you. And why were those um, translations, the ones that you found in the uh, Archivo General de la Administración, why were they so strongly censored, Both, uh, particularly this one? No, no, they, they weren't censored. They were approved. But they oh, were, they were um, approved. Okay. Yes, yes, they were approved for performance, but they, they, have, they have a copy there. Uh, so okay. Because ev everything that was uh, performed had to go through the through censorship. Okay, I thought it, okay, yeah. So it's very interesting. I recommend uh, visiting the, the Archivo General de la Misión is a very interesting experience. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, um, it's a kind of um, terror comedy experience. Um, <laughs> it's, it's both ridiculous and terrifying. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thanks.